Good morning. Welcome to South Peoria Baptist Church. We're glad you're here today. This is an awesome, awesome day. As we saw a few minutes ago, this is Biker Sunday for us today. And so they met at Mel's Diner and took uh, and had breakfast and took off on a run. Was it good? A nice day for it, wasn't it, Steve? It's a beautiful day for a bike ride today, and we're glad you guys are here today. And glad all of you are here today as our guests. Yesterday, we hosted a special time together. Uh, folks from the West Valley and even as far north as Bullhead City and around were here for a training seminar on how to share your faith. And a fellow named Ronnie Hill shared with us, and Ronnie travels all over the country talking to people about how to share your faith. And then God has used him in some powerful ways at some uh, places like Sturgis, Calgary Stampede, some of the NASCARs, uh, venues and things about setting up uh, booths and being able to share Christ and some of the things that some of you have done as well out there. And so Ronnie Hill is with us today and he is going to open up God's word for us in a powerful, powerful way. So give Ronnie a very special welcome right now. Thank you, Pastor. It's good to be here. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And if you don't have your Bibles, I think, do we have it on the screen? We have it on the screen. And so you can uh, look at it up there if you don't have your Bibles. But I'll need you to go to Romans 5, 12, and also Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. That should be about page 2 in your Bible. At least it is in mine, unless you have a bunch of family trees at the front and death certificates and stuff like that, birth certificates. Um, if we can, can we light this puppy up like on song one in here? And those of you that are viewing online, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll look forward to it. And if you want to reply, you can go to the top of the screen. Uh, it's contact, and you can email us and uh, let us know if you have any questions or any prayer requests. Uh, I have a wife named Jennifer. We've been married now for uh, 14 years. We have a little boy named Jake who's 11, and so... Uh, I love them, and I miss them when I'm gone. So as soon as the service is over with, I'm getting on a plane, flying back home, so I can get to see them tonight before he goes to bed, and I can pray for him and get to fellowship with them. But um, it's been fun being here. I've enjoyed it yesterday. had a good time, good meeting a lot of folks, and look forward to what God's going to do. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get started. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for uh, the heart that they have to reach people in this community and in this state. And I pray, Father, that you would... Uh, Bless them and speak to us right now. For those that don't know you, don't have a relationship with you, I pray, God, you just make it crystal clear how much you love them and want to change their life forever. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for the ones that were saved in the first service. And I pray you just continue to do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I got a little trivia question for you to get you all to pay attention. If you can answer this trivia question, the pastor's going to take you to lunch after church. Um, I, I would take you to lunch, but I can't. i got to catch my plane. But So here's the deal. Students, you cannot cheat. I don't want you looking down, Googling the answer. If I see you look down, you're disqualified. No lunch. No lunchy for you. Okay? So y'all ready? A little baseball trivia question. All right, here it is. Does anybody know who was in the World Series in 1924? 1924. And it is doable to answer this question, all right, for even for students. And, I, and this is where you can talk. Uh, people online, y'all just going to have to email, and then by then it's too late. But if you do get it right, if you get in the email in time, pastors still take you out. But, you, but don't be cheating. Okay. 1924. Who, who? Somebody said Yankees. Who said Yankees? Okay. It was not the Yankees, but it was a New York team was one of them. Who said that? Right here. My man in the blue shirt. He said the New York Giants. He's correct on one team. If you can get the other team, the pastor is taking you. Were you in the first service? Were you in the first service? All right. We'll just make sure that y'all not cheating. All right. If you get the other team, the pastor will take you to lunch. All right. So you got the other team? You get one guess. One guess. And, and these people would like to go eat today sometime, if you can tell us as soon as you can. 
Just get, just want, just give a team. Pittsburgh. Okay. Pastor, you're off the hook again. Who? Who did? Were you cheating? Okay, well, who'd you say? Chicago Cubs. Good guess. Well, you said it and you were still wrong. Okay, so <laughs> here's the deal. It was the old Washington Senators. Okay, now, if you follow baseball trivia and you like that kind of stuff, here's the deal. Old Washington Senators, they were based in Washington, D.C. They split off, became the new Washington Senators, moved to Minnesota. The old Washington Senators dissolved. The new Washington Senators ended up moving down to present-day Arlington, Texas, 30 miles from my house, where you got the present-day Texas Rangers. So technically, you could say... We won a World Series. Uh, that, that's about the only way we're going to win it. But that's, but that's what happened. So here it is. It was an incredible series. It was tied up three games each. You go the final and seventh game, it was being played in Washington. Fans were going nuts because here was their shot at winning the World Series. You go the bottom of the eighth inning, scores tied 2-2. Two to two. Series tied up three each. Fans are on their feet. All they have to do, hold the Giants three up, three down, come up by the ninth score run, they win the World Series. Top of the ninth, they did just that. Three outs, three up, three down, boom. Bottom of the ninth, first batter up of the centers. I mean, there's electricity in the air. Fans are jumping up and down, screaming, yelling. First batter up of the centers, he gets out. Second batter up of the centers, he gets out. Third batter up of the centers. If you could pick anybody on your team that you'd want at the plate, it was this guy. His name was Goose Goslin. And Goose, I think he was the MVP of the series. He'd already hit, I believe, up to this point, four or five home runs up to this point in the series. Goose steps up to the plate. Pitch throws the first ball right down the pipe. Strike one. Next pitch, another meat pitch. Strike two. He has an 0-2 count. Next two pitches are balls. He gets a 2-2 count with two outs, bottom of the ninth, score tied 2-2, two to two, series tied up three each. Do you understand there's only one more pitch that can get you any more bottom of the ninth? I mean, this is it. Next pitch comes down the plate. Goose steps into it, hits the ball. I'm not talking a blooper. I'm talking a shot to left center. And if it's on ESPN today, the announcer says, bah, 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 bah. everybody's on their feet. They know it's going to be another home run by Goose Goslin. Goose rounds first, head to second. The ball comes down, hits six inches from the top of the left center field fence. It ricochets back in the outfield. Center fielder, left fielder, chase the ball down now. Goose rounds second, head to third. Third base coach realizes this might be the only chance to have to score. So he weighs him home as he's bringing Goose home. Center fielder takes the ball, throws him to shortstop. Shortstop relays to the catcher. Catcher is standing over home plate. Goose is now sliding. He has clearly beat the throw by at least two steps. As he's sliding, catcher catches it, tags him. Umpire says, you're out. And when he did, the fans went nuts. They start throwing all kinds of trash and debris on the field, cussing the umpires out, threatening to kill them, like a lot of your little league games around here. And uh, I know how you parents get, you know what I'm talking about? And so umpires, they went to pitcher's mound for a conference, probably because it was also the safest place on the field at that time. So everybody in the stands knew what was going to happen. Everybody saw he beat the throw by two steps. So they're thinking, everybody, in the, all the fans are going, well, you know, they're going to correct it. So they're, they're thinking they're going to talk to the head umpire and says, hey, he was safe. He's like, oh, I didn't know. There's dirt in my eye. I didn't see it. And like, yeah, he said, okay, he'll be safe, score, win the World Series. That's what everybody's thinking. Fifteen minutes goes by. This is still debated to this day. Fifteen minutes goes by. The head umpire comes out. He says, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? The runner is still out, but not because the play at the plate. The runner's out because he missed first base. And just like Goose was called out that day because he missed first base, there's a lot of people in this auditorium, a lot of people in this world, when they stand before a holy God on judgment day, they're going to be called out and sent to hell. Not because they weren't religious. Not because they weren't baptized, not because they didn't put money in the plate, not because they didn't do good things, but because they missed first base spiritually. You say, Ryan, how, how do we miss first base spiritually? The Bible shows us in Romans chapter 5, 
verse 12, how you and I can hit first base spiritually. Because many people have missed it. Many people have been deceived and lied to by Satan. So let's look and see what the Bible says. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says this. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sin. You say, Ryan, I don't understand what that means. Death came through one man, all sin because one, I don't understand. What's all that about? Hold your place in Romans 5. Go all the way back to about page 2 in your Bible. All right, so that's Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Genesis 2, verse 15. And the Bible says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, does everybody understand the parameters that God has set up in the garden for Adam and Eve? He told Adam and Eve, Hey, Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree in the garden. But you eat from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, you will die. He didn't say you might die. He didn't say you're going to get sick. He said you will die. That's the playing rules in the garden. Everybody got that? We on the same page? Hey, church, y'all, we on the same page? I don't know where y'all located the first service. They have an excuse. They were earlier. Y'all, y'all have at least had two more cups of coffee than they have. So let's get awake here, okay? So, so what took place then after that? All right, here we go. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, let's pick up the story. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, oh, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the trees in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. Verse 4. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. All right, let's just stop there for a second. Let me ask you a question. Is there anybody in this place, anybody, anybody in here that is never, ever physically going to die? Take the second coming of Jesus. Take that out of the picture. Anybody here never going to die? You're never going to get cancer. Uh, You're never going to uh, be in a car wreck. Um, you're, you're never going to be, uh, you're never going to have another birthday because more birthdays we have, older we get, more our organs shut down. On. Anybody here never, ever physically going to die? Church, are we going to die? So what does that make Satan? A liar. He told them, you will not die. Pastor, do you do funerals in this church? Do you know that every time the pastor does a funeral in this church, it's proof it's evidence Satan is a liar. Go find you a cemetery. You look at hundreds and hundreds of rows of, of grave sites. Hey, folks, that is proof, evidence Satan is a liar. Do you know what he's going to do to you in just a minute? He's going to come to you and say, hey, uh, you don't need to hit first base spiritually. You're a good person. You never killed anybody. You're going, you're going to heaven. He's a liar. Don't let him lie to you and deceive you like he did Adam and Eve in the garden. Listen, you know, here's what's going to happen. In just a minute, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give your life to Christ, to repent and turn from your sins and say, yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. And and here's what Satan's going to do. He's going to say, hey, you you don't need to be going down front and doing that. People are going to look at you. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to talk about you. He's a liar. I've never seen anybody do that. I've been doing this for 28 years all over the world. I have never seen somebody come forward in church, give the life to Christ, and people go, oh, can you believe that? Did you see that? I don't care how long you've been a member of this church. I've never seen anybody do that. I, you know what I've seen? Tears of joy because of people crying and excited about somebody that they've been praying for for years to give their life to Christ. You know what else I've seen? I've seen other people thinking, do I, do I need to do that? I'm, I, think, I need to do that. I've never done that before. I need, that's what I've seen. I, and I have never seen somebody come forward and regret going, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I've never seen that. I've seen peace and joy. That's what's going to happen to you in just a minute. So don't let Satan lie to you and deceive you like he did Adam and Eve in the garden. Pick up the story, verse 6. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both them were open, and they realized they were, 
and I'm from Texas, so we say it like this, um, naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Okay, y'all with me at this point, church? So God said, you can eat from any tree. You eat from this one, you're going to die. Satan says, you're not going to die. She took some, she ate it, gave some to Adam. They realized they don't have clothes on. They went and hid in the garden. All right, hold your place in Genesis. Go all the way back now to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man. Who's the one man? Adam. It says, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sin. Folks, here's what the Word of God's saying. From that one action in the garden where Adam and Eve disobeyed God, from that one action, sin entered into the world. But not only did sin enter the world, death also entered into the world as a result of their sin. You said, Ronnie, you're sitting here telling me today that because what Adam and Eve did in the garden, that that's why I've inherited sin? Yep. You say, because I've inherited sin because of what they did, that's why I'm going to die one day? Yep. You said, Ronnie, that is not fair. That's just not fair. If that had been me that day in the garden, I wouldn't have eaten from the tree. Oh, yes, you would have. You say, oh, no, I wouldn't have, Ronnie. I'd have got like 50 yards away from that tree. I wouldn't have even come close to that tree. Please. You can't even come to church this morning out sinning. And you're going to tell me you're going to be in the garden all those years and never sin? Don't get all high and religious on me. Don't be acting. Don't be pulling that on me. Because I know we got a bunch of sinners here today. Don't, you say, oh, no. No, Brother Ronnie, not me. I am a good girl. I, I'm a good boy. I love Jesus. Pray the Lord. I, I got my church clothes on this morning. I love Jesus. Hey, I guarantee you there's some sinning going on in your house before you even got here this morning. Especially you ladies. I guarantee you, 90% of you ladies, you sin before you can get out the door of your house this morning. Don't, don't be getting all cat clawed on me. All right, all right watch. Tell me. I, I'm in the pulpit. I'm preaching the truth. So tell me, did this or did this not take place in your home this morning? Especially you ladies that got kids. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Because I got, I got a kid. I know. So this morning, you're getting the kids up, getting ready for church. You got them in there at a the little breakfast table, and they're eating a the little fruity pebbles. And so, and it's the boy. It's always the boy. There in the box of Fruity Pebbles, is a, there's a prize. And you told him you cannot have that prize until all the Fruity Pebbles are gone. So what's he do? When you go out of the room, he gets his grubby little paw, sticks it down in there, gets that prize of Fruity Pebbles, pulls them out. Fruity Pebbles go all over the place. So now you're getting your little dust busting. You have to vacuum all that up. Your other little boy goes in your closet, gets your little lipstick stuff. No, not that's the little girl. <laughs> gets your little lipstick stuff. Spirit all over her face. And she's like, Mama, do I look pretty? And your little boy goes in your closet, gets your pantyhose, puts on his head, rips your pantyhose, run around playing cops and robbers and shooting everything, pow, pow, pow. And what's your husband doing in the middle of all this? Hey, can't you people be quiet in there? I work hard for this family. All I ask for is one day, the Lord's day, for some peace and quiet to read the sports section and watch a little ESPN. Is that too much to ask? And so all this fighting and commotion going on and stuff. And so finally, you're in the bathroom, and you put that little black stuff on your eyes. Whatever that black, I don't even know what that black stuff is. And you put that on your eyes, and your husband comes in there and says, Honey, we got to go. If we don't go now, we're going to be late. And you know if we're late, all the good seats in the back are taken up, and we're going to sell the front row by the preachers. And ladies, what'd you say? Honey, I'll be ready in a minute. That's a lie. You just lied to your husband because there is not a woman on this planet that can get ready in a minute. And so you lied, and you didn't even go out the door. All the men are going, that's right, preach it. Preach it. Woman, you don't drag me to church? All right, there it is. He's talking to you. Spent half my life waiting on my wife. But, men, we sin too, don't we? All right, hey, listen. I'm in the pulpit. i got to preach the truth. Do I not have to preach the truth? So I'm just going to tell you right now. Just because I'm a preacher don't mean I'm some super saint. I mess up. I sin just like everybody else. And there are a lot of sins I deal with, but there is one I deal with every single day. I'm just going to tell you the truth. It is hard for me to get into my truck in Haslett, Texas, and drive to DFW Airport on this little highway called 114. Six-lane highway. Six lanes. Guess what the speed limit is on that puppy? 
55 on a six lane. Then there is one part, it goes from 55 to 40. 40. I'm, I'm thinking I could jump out of my truck and run backwards 40 miles an hour. Why is it 40 miles an hour? Police officer told me the reason, reason it's 40 is because there's a hill right there. And so people coming the other direction can't see us coming. So I'm like, well, don't punish us. Give them a mirror. Shoot it down the hill so they can see us coming. You know what I'm saying? But it goes from 55 to 40. And so, man, we're on the way to church this morning, right? And there's somebody in front of us not even drive the speed limit. So what do we do? We'll show them, won't we? We cut them off. And I'm talking about here in the church parking lot. We're driving like that. Especially after church when people are trying to go to lunch. Y'all know what I'm doing. Listen, if you're going to drive like that, take them Jesus things off the back of your truck. I don't have any on mine. Because I, I just hadn't arrived. Some, some of y'all got them Jesus fish. Some of y'all got little whole guppies. The whole guppy family. Some of y'all got, got the Jesus kneeling at the cross with the, with the cowboy, you know, with the horse and the reins and, and stuff. Listen, I don't have anything like that on my truck because I have not arrived yet. I'm still working on that. I'm not going to drag the name of Jesus through the mud. So, you, listen, you want to put something on the back of your truck? Put on there a bumper sticker that says, uh, I'm a Jehovah Witness. Follow me to church. Do something like that. I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm joking. I'm not serious. I'm just kidding. Listen. We all sin. All the, all the students are going, that's right. Priest to my parents. They're always sinning and stuff, and they're preaching to me, so priest to them. Uh, hey, uh, students, you sin too. Don't act like you don't sin. You go, oh, no, but I, I don't sin. I don't sin. Uh, no, your mom and dad tell you to clean your room, and you go, but it is clean. And you got stuff growing there. The EPA don't even know what it is. Hey, listen, your brother or sister that's been missing for two weeks, don't put their picture on a milk carton. They're under your bed. Clean your room. That's where they're at, under your bed. See, but here's the deal. Whether you think it's a little bitty sin or you think it's a big sin, everybody in this place, we all sin. We mess up. And because we sin, guess what the consequences of our sin? It's death and hell. That's what we deserve because we've sinned against a holy, righteous God. We deserve hell. There's nobody in here deserves to go to heaven. Nobody. Not me, not this worship team, not the pastor, not, none of us. We deserve hell. That's what we deserve. But guess what? I got some good news for you. And this is why you came. You came to hear this good news I'm about to tell you. And here's the good news. Romans 5, verse 17 says this. There's hope. And here's verse 17. It says, for if by the trespass of the one man, now is that some, talking about somebody getting on somebody else's land? No, the trespass means sin. So if by the trespass or the sin of the one man, the one man's who? is Adam. It says, for by the sin of that one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Folks, here's what the Word of God's saying. One man, Adam, brought us sin, death, and destruction. But one man, Jesus, brought us life, grace, righteousness, purpose, meaning, hope. One man brought us down, but one man, Jesus, brought us up. I don't know why that's so hard to understand. Why it's so hard to understand is through the blood of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Never been by church membership. Never by being, being good. Hey, I don't care what kind of Bible you have. I don't care if you have a Catholic Bible, Protestant Bible. What I'm preaching is in your Bible. And the Bible says it's not a denomination. It's not a religion. It's not a church membership. It's not baptism. It's not being good. It's blood. Blood has to cover your sin. Because your sin and my sin, it's serious before God. And you can't just wipe out a sin by throwing some money in the plate. That doesn't do it. It takes blood. And it's always taking blood to get forgiveness of sin. You say, but wait, Ronnie. I got a little bone to pick with you. You say it takes blood to get forgiveness of sin. All right, Jesus died on the cross about, what, 2,000 years ago? So, okay. So, you know, cults and stuff, they change their religion as they go to kind of fit the time. Uh, so then it's, if it took blood for Jesus to get forgiveness of sin, it should always take blood. Hey, guess what, church? It has always taken blood to get forgiveness of sin. You say, well, what happened between Jesus and all the way back to Adam and Eve? 
What happened between Adam and Eve and up to Jesus? What happened all there? It should always be blood. It's always been blood. I want you to do hold your place in Romans 5. Go back one more time to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to catch you up on the speed where we're at, and I'm going to read one verse to you out of Genesis. Are you ready? Do you remember the story? God said, you can eat from any tree. You eat from this one, though, you're going to die. Satan said, you're not going to die. She says, it does look good. So Eve took it. She ate from the tree, gave some to Adam. He ate. They realized, poof, they don't have any clothes on. They went and hid in the garden. God comes walking by the cool of the day. Adam, Eve, where are you? Psst, we're over here. Over where? Psst, by these bushes. Well, what are you doing behind the bushes? <laughs> Duh, we don't have any clothes on. Who told you you don't have any clothes on? You ate from the tree, didn't you? Come here. So he calls them out. Now, the Bible says they've been back there making clothes out of fig leaves. Why fig leaves? I have no idea. Do we have anybody in here that's ever picked any figs before? Got any fig pickers? All right. Hey, fig pickers, can I get a witness? Fig leaves are itchy. Are they not? So they've been back there making clothes out of fig leaves, and it's like, you know, it, that just goes to show one of two things. One, they just didn't have any common sense. Or two, it was the first bush they come to. That's the only thing I can think of. So they come out there these fig leaf outfits, and God just like, mm, mm, mm. Seriously, out of all the plants I make, and you choose a fig leaf? R- really? Come here. He says, Adam, here's the deal. Because you disobeyed me, I'm pronouncing a curse on you. So from now on, men from all over the world, from every tribe, nation, language, they're going to have to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week to earn a paycheck to put food on the table because what you did today here in the garden. What was that response? God, it wasn't me. It was that woman you gave me. God said, I know. He said, all right, Eve. Because, calm down, ladies. Calm down. He said, all right, Eve, because you got Adam and Eve from the tree, I'm pronouncing a curse on you. So from now on, women from all over the world, from every tribe, nation, language, every time they go to have a baby, they're going to have to have an epidural because of what you did today here in the garden. What was Eve's response? But God wasn't me. It was that snake. God said, I know. Serpent, because you lied to them, deceived them, got them from tree, I'll pronounce a curse on you. So from now on, men from all over the world, from every tribe, nation, language, every time they see your skinny, nasty little head, they're going to get a shovel, a hoe, a shotgun, a machete, a club, something like that. They're going to stomp on your head. They're going to kill you. Whether you're a good snake or a bad snake, it don't matter. You die from here on out. Unless you get lucky, you run one of them jokers on the Discovery Channel. They're crazy. They might let you go. But everybody else is going to kill you. What did the serpent say? But God, it wasn't my fault. It was, it was the dirt. <laughs> Not for real. But, but do you see what everybody's doing? What's everybody doing? Trying to blame somebody else for their own sin, right? Hey, church, has anything changed today? How about this? Pick up a newspaper. Judge, it's not my fault I shot and killed all those people. It's society's fault. Oh, judge, it's not my fault I drowned my kids. It's my parents' fault. Oh, judge, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's. And what's the Word of God saying? It's not society's fault. It's not the government's fault. It's not your parents' fault. It's your fault. You have sinned against a holy, righteous God. So what did God do because Adam and Eve sinned against him in the garden? Genesis 3, verse 21. The Bible says this. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Did you catch that? If you hunt, you probably caught it. If you don't hunt, let me break it down for you. For the first time in the garden where the lion and lamb could play together, God had to take an innocent little lamb. He had to slit his throat. He had to hang him up from a tree, skin him out, and use the skin from that lamb to make clothes for Adam. Why why did he have to do that? Because of sin. And because of sin, blood was shed in the garden. In the garden, it was one lamb for one man. But it didn't stop there. Do, Do you remember when the children of Israel in Egypt and they were slavery to Pharaoh, and they cried out, God save us, God rescue us. So God sent Moses down to get the people out of Egypt. Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to let them go. So God sent plague after plague after plague after plague. Do you remember the final last plague? 
God said, I'm fed up with him. He said, Moses, you tell Pharaoh, if he don't let my people go, I'm coming through tonight, and I'm going to kill the firstborn male. Whether it's an animal or a human being, firstborn male dies throughout Egypt tonight. But Moses, you tell my people, if they'll take a lamb, they'll slit its throat, they'll drain the blood into a bowl, they'll take a branch, they'll dip in that blood, they'll go to the front of their door of their house, they'll wipe the blood on the side of their house, on the side of the, over the top of the door, and over the other side of the door, then when I come through tonight and I get to their house and I see the what, church? The blood. I will pass over. That's where we get pass over from. I will pass over and spare their whole family. Do you see the progression? In the garden, it was one lamb for one man. In Egypt, one lamb spared a family, but it didn't stop there. Children of Israel, God got them out of Egypt. They got out of Egypt. They were out in the wilderness. He delivered them. While they were out there, God said, we're going to set up a portable church building. We're going to call it a tabernacle. He said, there's going to be an outer court out there. That's where an altar is. That's where sacrifice is going to be made. There's going to be an inner court, a place of worship. But there's going to be a place back here, Moses, called the Holy of Holies. Moses, nobody could come back here. The only person that could come back here, because there's going to be a huge curtain that separates the Holy of Holies from everything else and everybody else. And Moses, this is where the Ark of the Covenant is. This is where I'm going to show up. I'm going to manifest my presence. And Moses, the only person that could come to my presence is your brother Aaron, the high priest. He can only come one day a year. And on that day, on that one day a year, the Day of Atonement, he has to bring with him blood from a lamb. And I want him to wear special clothes, go through special ceremonial cleansings. And I want him to bring that blood from that lamb. And I want him to sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat, for the forgiveness of sin for the entire nation of Israel. Do you see the progression in the garden? It was one lamb for one man. In Egypt, one lamb spared a family. In the wilderness, one lamb got forgiveness of sin for the entire nation of Israel. But if it stopped there, you and I still would be without hope for two reasons. Number one, the majority of us in here, we're not Israelites. Guess what? If you were an Israelite, according to the Torah, the law required a blood sacrifice to get forgiveness of sin. So guess what? When I pulled up in the church parking lot out here today, I didn't see any stock trailers. You got any calves on you? You got some steers, heifers, goats, lambs that you can sacrifice, get forgiveness of sin? Don't have that on you? How are you going to get forgiveness of sin then? Because, see, the law required a blood sacrifice. So here's what took place. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, we've been separated from God. So God's whole plan was to bring us back to a right relationship with him. So you know what he did? He sent prophet after prophet saying a Messiah was coming, a Savior of the world. And Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus came, it prophesied that he was going to come, that he was going to be born of a virgin, that he was going to be bruised for our transgressions. By his stripes, we will be healed. So find the last Old Testament prophet is preaching, John the Baptist. As John the Baptist is preaching in John chapter 1, verse 29, he's preaching and baptizing people, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he's preaching this, he looks up, he sees Jesus coming. Do you know his exact words were when he saw Jesus? He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the entire world. The world, church. That's why we can have forgiveness of sin, because Jesus is the final blood sacrifice once and for all for all mankind church what's the song we sing what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow it's always taking blood to get forgiveness of sin and if your sins pay attention it's the most important thing if your sins have never been covered by the blood of jesus I don't care how long you've been a member of this church. I don't care how good a person you've been, all the good deeds you've done. If your sins have never been covered by the blood of Jesus, I don't care who you are, you have missed first base spiritually, and you'll spend eternity in hell. It doesn't matter how well you round second, third, and you're on your way home, you miss first base spiritually, nothing else matters. You say, well, then how do I hit first base spiritually, Ronnie? In just a minute, I'm going to give you an opportunity for you to say, yes. I admit I've sinned against God. And for you to pray, and it'll go something like this. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've messed up. I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to turn from my sins. And I want to invite you into my life to be my boss, my Lord, my Savior. If you've never done that before, and you would like for your sins to be covered by the blood of Jesus, he can do that right here, right now, today. 
And I'm going to tell you something. He'll give you peace that you've never had before. Your sins could be covered, and you can walk out of here white as snow, forgiven, knowing for sure that when you spend eternity, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. You can have that today. You say, well, Ronnie, if I do that in just a minute, what, what, what does that mean? What will happen? Well, here's the good news. You ready? Romans 5, 21, and we're done, says this. So that just as sin, verse 21, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you know what that means? That means that you can know for sure today when you die, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. Hey, as, as it happens right now, if I, and I pray it doesn't. If we were to have to do one of your funerals today, right here, if we were to have to do your funeral, there's many in here today that the pastor would have to side skirt the issue of where you're spending eternity. Because he wouldn't want to hurt your family's feelings and tell them, hey, I'm sorry, but uh, your husband or your wife or your kids, they're in hell right now. We don't like to say that to people. We don't like to tell the truth about that. But that would be the issue. So in order not to do that, he'd have to side skirt the issue and not have to say exactly where you're spending eternity. If you give your life to Christ today and, and say, I, I want to do that, I want to be all in. Because see, some of y'all been pay, playing poker with Jesus for a long time. You've just been anteing up, throwing a chip in every now and then. I'm not talking about throwing a chip in. I'm talking about pushing all the chips in and saying, hey, I'm all in on this Jesus. If you've never done that before and you'd like to, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus will change your life. He'll give you peace and purpose that you've never had before. I'm not blowing smoke. It's Jesus. He's real. He really did change my life, and he can change yours. And if you do that, he'll give you peace that you've never had before. There was a 17-year-old girl that was raped by an 18-year-old guy. And according to a lot of people in this world, she should have an abortion. Matter of fact, two Republican candidates even said that, that if a girl's raped, they need to have an abortion. Uh, a lady tried to take her to an abortion clinic to get her to abort the baby. She said, no, I'm going to have the baby. Nine months later, she had a six and a half pound baby boy. And that baby boy is me. And I want you to know, I'm not here today by accident. I'm here for a reason and a purpose. Just like you're not here by some accident. You know what my life verse is now? My life verse is Genesis 50, verse 20, which says, What you intend to harm for me, God intended for the good, for the saving of many souls. Jeremiah 1, 5 says, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you and I set you apart. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Do, do you understand? The only reason that you are here, the, and I'm not talking about in this church. I'm talking about the only reason that you're alive right now is because God created you for a relationship with Him. That's why you were created. And so if you don't have that relationship with Him, the very reason that you were created doesn't exist. That's why you don't have any purpose or any meaning in life. But Jesus died on the cross for you to wipe out your sin. So all this stuff that's happened since Adam and Eve were sin in the garden and we've been separated from God, God's whole plan was to bring us back to a right relationship with him. That's why Jesus died on the cross for us, so we can have peace and purpose and meaning and be in right standing with him, our sins forgiven forever. That's never happened to you. And you want that peace? He'll change your life forever. I mean, I'm talking today. You say, Ronnie, so does that mean everything's going to be perfect in my life from here on out? No, because guess what? We live in a fallen world. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, this place has been messed up. And guess what? It's not God's fault. So don't blame something on God that he didn't do. My, my mom was raped. God didn't do that to my mom. That was my biological father's sin that did that to my mom. His choice. My mom didn't do that. God didn't do that. That was because God, he said, why did God, stop? why didn't he stop him? Why didn't God stop him from doing that? Because God gives us all a free choice because he loves us so much. So you're free to choose him or you're free to reject him. But I want you to know this. It is so awesome. And if, if you give your life to him, you have peace. I, I don't know why people would not want a relationship with a creator who loved them and died on the cross for them. You can have that today. Say how? 
I'm going to give you an opportunity. And we're not praying some magical prayer. We're not praying now, lay me down to sleep. I'm talking about saying, hey, I'm all in on this Jesus. I admit, I have sinned, I've blown it, I've messed up. And God, I want to give my life to you. If you want to do that, he'll change your life. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I want to ask you to give me two minutes for nobody to get up, nobody leave, nobody talk, no band people, no deacons, ushers, nobody. This is the most important time of the entire service. If you want a relationship with Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray that prayer with me right now. You just pray silently with me to God, and you can invite the creator of this universe into your life if you've never done that before. Can you do me a favor? Can we bow our heads and close our eyes, please? With heads bowed, eyes closed. You say, Ryan, that's me. I've missed first base spiritually, and I need to hit it this morning. If that's you with heads bowed and eyes closed, then you just pray this prayer with me right now, right where you're seated. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I've messed up. And I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. And God, I turn from my sins. And I invite you into my life to be my boss and my Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And thank you for saving me, Lord Jesus. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one's looking around. I'm not going to come to you and embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I don't believe in that. I just want to pray for you. If you're here this morning, and you say, Ronnie, for the first time in my life, I understood what I was doing. I meant business. I just prayed that prayer, and I'm all in. If you just prayed that prayer with me just now, would just those of you that prayed that prayer, would you just look up at me right now and let me catch your eyes? Just those that prayed that prayer, look up and let me catch your eyes. Say, Ronnie, that's me. Yes, ma'am, right here. Yes, ma'am, right back here. You say, Ronnie, I prayed that prayer. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Yes, sir. Over here. Got you, sweetie. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Anybody else over here? On this side. Here in the middle. Say, Ron, that's me. I just prayed that prayer. Just look up. Let me catch your eyes. Okay. Over here on this side. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else over here? Yes, sir. Anybody else over here? In the back. Okay, got you. Yes, sir. Over here. All right. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else over here? All right, got you, buddy. Anybody else? All right, would you do me a favor? Would just those of you that pray that prayer, would you just keep looking up at me just for a second? Everybody else's heads bowed, eyes closed, just those that pray that prayer. I want to share something with you from God's Word that's going to encourage you. I want you to know this. All of you that just prayed that prayer and invited Christ to come to your life, according to what the Bible says, He's forgiven you of everything you've ever done. I'm talking every sin every bad deed, everything. You say, well, you don't know how bad I've been. No, the blood of Jesus covers all sin. All, not some of them, all of them. So I want you to know he has forgiven you. He has cleansed you. He's come to live in you. And you know the other good news is? He'll never leave you. You know what the Bible says in Psalms? It says, though my mother or father forsake me, he says, I never will. Hey, there's gonna be a lot of people let us down in life. A lot of people leave us. Moms, dads, husbands, wives. He says, but I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You say, okay, so what does that mean now? Now he's come to live in you. You need to let everybody know. You say, how do I do that? Jesus, who died on the cross for you. I mean, I'm talking about they drove spikes through his wrists and through his feet. He was beat to a pulp for your sins to be wiped out. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 32 and 33. He said, if you confess me before men... I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. He says, if you don't confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father who's in heaven. It's imperative we take a stand for Christ, that we let everybody know. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you have a great week. We can't wait to see you next time here at South Peoria Baptist Church.